Funding for To the Contrary provided by the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, the Colcom Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. Contrary. I'm host Bonnie Herve. This week we speak with woman thought leader Dr. Kathy Sullivan. She has been up and down and all the way around because she was the first American woman to walk in space and she's also the first woman to go to the Challenger Deep, which is the deepest part of the ocean. Dr. Sullivan, you are an author, a scientist, a speaker. Uh, is there anything that you don't do? And please tell us the name of your new book. <laughs> oh, thanks, Bonnie. Great to talk with you. Uh, I'm not going to start into the long list of things that I don't do. You don't have time for, <laughs> for all of that. Um, but the book that uh, came out last November, a combination memoir of my life and of uh, an untold chapter of the Hubble Space Telescope's life is called Handprints on Hubble, an astronaut's story of invention. And I chose the title because astronauts spacewalking around Hubble to fix it over the years actually have left real fingerprints, real scuff marks on it. Uh, but the team of people I write about that worked on Hubble for five years before it was put into orbit, I argue they have metaphorical handprints on Hubble because their contributions were so critical to Hubble's success. Uh, tell me about those, the contributions of the people who, you know, who essentially will be lost to history. Well, they would be lost to history, and that was my concern. They're kind of the hidden figures of the Hubble story, to borrow that analogy. Um, it's a group of engineers based predominantly at uh, NASA's center in Huntsville, Alabama, the Marshall Space Flight Center. Some of the uh, jo Johnson Space Center in Houston, uh, who were specialists in spacewalking methods and in training spacewalkers like me. And then uh, maybe even more importantly, a squad of engineers, maintainability engineers, at uh, the Lockheed Missiles in Space Company out in Sunnyvale, California. That's the group that got the charge to take this telescope that had been designed sort of theoretically to be maintainable on orbit and actually dig in and make sure that the tools and the support equipment, you know, the handles, everything you might need to actually take up spare parts and put them in, install them and do all of that at 17,500 miles an hour in zero gravity where your tools will float away if you don't tether them, and you're about as you're you're Michelin man bulky. So it's a it's a tough environment to work in, and uh, that that was their task. The plan is to maintain it, but we actually need all the tools and equipment to do that. You guys go figure it out. <laughs> so tell me, what drove you to want to not just be an astronaut, but also go to the deepest parts of the ocean? Well, the diving deep in the ocean is sort of back to my original roots. Uh, my original training is as an oceanographer. Uh, in my case, I worked predominantly in the Atlantic, the North Atlantic Ocean, before joining NASA. But I never lost my love for the ocean and, and my fascination with the planet writ large, every aspect of geology and geography and meteorology. Uh, that's really the original impetus for all of my studies. And frankly, it's the reason fundamentally that I applied the opportunity to become an astronaut because the bottom line, the big personal bottom line for me was if I managed to get through all of the wickets and beat the odds and get selected, I would get to see the earth from orbit with my own eyes instead of just looking at other people's pictures. Um, and tell me, what about being way the heck up there in space and very as deep as you can get in the ocean? Are there similarities? Yeah, there are some similarities. On a level of personal experience, what I find um, fascinating and endlessly intriguing about both is, you know, I'm, I'm in, in both cases, I'm in some container, some capsule uh, that strikes me as being magical, although there's no magic to it at all. It's just expertise and science and engineering, you know, brought, brought into play to make something extraordinary uh, possible. And But that capsule lets me be somewhere that otherwise I have no business being either in the 
harsh and hostile environment of the deep sea, where at the, at the bottom of the Marianas Trench, instead of one atmosphere of pressure weighing on our bodies like we have here as we talk, you have a thousand times that pressure. It's eight tons of pressure. So the magic capsule of the submersible lets me sit there feeling and dressed just like I am here and feeling just like I am here and keeping all those eight tons of pressure out. And then when, if you're going into orbit, it's sort of the reverse problem. I now need to seal one atmosphere of pressure inside my capsule and prevent it from escaping, which would expose me to the vacuum of space. So that experience of being able to be in a, an engineered environment that feels to me very natural, uh, that, I, that I know how to operate, and yet be in these extraordinary places with the, the vast view of space back to the earth or the, the magic of the, the wonderful mysteries of life in the ocean all around me. But you, know, you, you can't go out to those places. You can get there in these engineered vehicles. And then if you, another level of detail down, some of the technical challenges of making those vehicles work, making the craft actually sustain your life in these crazy places. There's some broad parallels to the technical challenges. What did you see when you were walking in space? And what did you see uh, that maybe surprised you or fascinated you when you were uh, in, the, in the Marianas Trench? Well, yeah, when you're walking in space, you've got this extraordinary panorama. You can see something on the order of a thousand miles in every direction. Uh, and when you're crossing over the daylight side of the earth, it's, it's, it's kind of like a magical school bus ride through you know, every, every world atlas you ever knew, right? There are the countries. There are, they actually are the shapes that you saw on the maps in grade school. I mean, there, there are all these amusing little trivial insights that I think we all tend to chuckle about. Uh, my most vivid memory from my spacewalk uh, is one of those moments on the daylit side where I had a chance to pause in my work and uh, stop paying attention to where I was placing my hands, which is what you're usually focused on, and sort of just look around and take in more broadly where I was. And as it happened at that moment, when I looked towards my toes, uh, my feet were pointing down towards the earth, and I watched you know, all of the Caribbean Sea in Venezuela slide between my boots. And that great span of the world sliding between my boots took maybe, you know, it took not even a minute. That's how fast we were going. The fl it's very much the flip side when you go deep into the sea. You don't have a big expanse of view. You can only see as far as the lights on your submarine uh, illuminate. And in the case of the limiting factor, uh, the submersible built by Triton submarines that I was in a couple weeks ago, I would guesstimate that's on the order of maybe 30 feet. And it's just inky, pitch black beyond that, that horizon of light. Uh, we landed on this sediment-covered portion of the floor of the Marianas Trench and cruised along across that, um, along a traverse. Um, it reminded me of a moonscape. It was sort of a tannish gray color. And, and maybe because I remember watching clips from the lunar flights as they came in for landing on the moon in the 60s and 70s. That's part of what the image, that's maybe, maybe why the image came to my mind. Uh, we did see some animal tracks on the bottom, and um, you know, there are sea cucumbers that live down there. There's very exotic uh, kinds of worms. Uh, there are uh, little critters called amphipods, which are you know, probably no more than about yay big and somewhat cousins to the pill bug you might have in your garden. That's They, they look a bit like that. Um, but our, what we are trying to do on but no our fish. Diet, no yeah, no you don't see, crazy you looking don't see fish. fish but, you don't see fish below about 8,000 meters, and we were you know, three 3,000 meters deeper than that. So it tends to be bacteria and worms and um, amphipods and uh, sea cucumbers and critters like that. Um, and what was the most fascinating thing you saw? My most fascinating insights have come from going back and looking at the, the high-resolution video that we were, we were taking at the bottom as we went along. Uh, and that the coolest sight from my expedition ended up not happening uh, directly on my dive, but was captured by one of the robotic landers that we put down on the bottom. And when this thing settled to the bottom, it clearly woke up or disturbed some little critter that was probably just happily napping away. And it was a, called a polychaete worm. I would guess maybe it's, it might be about that large. And you could see him so sort of squirm out from underneath the foot of this lander, and then he just starts swimming vertically up along the lander right through the camera view. And he, he looks like a 
just looks like this wafting piece of white with these wonderful little filaments, probably feeding tentacles dangling off the side. Every foray into these deepest parts of the ocean is, is changing our understanding of, of the ocean in Toto because they are so bad, so little explored, so little is known of them. Uh, so refining our understanding of, of the bottom topography, what, what actually is the shape and structure of this geologic environment called the Marianas Trench, um, that was one of our objectives. Every one of these creatures that you observe is one of very few of that type that's ever been seen. And very often, especially if your dive is focused on the biology, you almost always find at least some species that you haven't seen before. Uh, the final thing that that strikes me, uh, not again from my dive explicitly, but from this set of expeditions, is when critters, when biologic samples have been brought up from the very deepest parts of the trenches and examined real carefully, you do find microplastics in these super deep animals uh, above the background level uh, that you, you you would expect otherwise. Microplastics meaning pieces of trash, plastic yeah. trash? Yeah, they're very, I mean, micro, you know, not some chunk of styrofoam, but, you know, little micro bits of plastic. And what that says to me and, and should, I think, reinforce to all of us is that just tells you how richly, fully, and completely interconnected every part of our planet is. So we might, you know, sit in New York or Washington or Ohio and say, I'm not connected to the very honest trench at all. But human life on this earth is connected into that trench environment. And biologically, uh, the whole ocean ecosystem connects directly to our life. So you get vivid reminders of that that uh, I hope we can help people take to heart. See, you are putting a very positive spin on what you saw. But the first thing that occurred to me is that man is trashing not just the top, you know, the surface of the earth and the environment, the uh, atmosphere above the earth, but the ocean all the way down to parts that, um, you know, the, the most remote parts of the world. Why didn't you see it that way? Well, I, you know, it's been clear to me from my academic studies and my space experience that, you know, we, humankind is a vast living experiment on this planet, and we leave our fingerprints on the planet in many, many, many ways. Uh, you know, to, to say we're trashing you know, it connotes or, or suggests motives that I think most people don't have. Uh, we're, you know, it, it's, it, it is happening by virtue of the mass of society, the mass of humankind, the way we're living our, uh, our lives and constructing our economies. Uh, and we just need to get more attentive to that. There are, you know, there are alternatives we could take on if we put our mind to it. But, you know, human nature is such that out of sight, out of mind uh, drives a lot of human behavior. So bringing these examples to the foreground that there's now measured proof that even at this very exotic remote location that you might have wished to say has nothing to do with you, uh, you are impacting it and the ocean is impacting your life every day. Every other breath you take is generated by organisms in the ocean. Uh, the, the moderation and balancing of our climate and weather systems, that's because of the heat capacity and the circulation of the ocean. So we are completely connected in, in very tight interdependencies to life in the ocean. Now, it takes, what, four or five hours to get all the way down to that great depth, correct? Yeah, the uh, craft that I was in called Limiting Factor, that takes four hours. How long it takes really depends on the shape of the submersible that you're in. So, but this one takes about four hours down and four hours up. What was that dive like? What were you thinking? What were you seeing? You know, it's uh, two metaphors come to mind. It's a, you know, it's a very calm, serene, four-hour-long elevator ride. <laughs> way that I likened it. Uh, and it, it's just, it is a confined space. This, this craft has room for two people and, and it's not, you know, jammed up against each other, two people, but, uh, it's also a little bit like, um, well, altogether about a 12 hour long airplane ride in economy with the seatbelt sign on all the time. There's, there's not enough room to stand up and walk around, but you can adjust your position a bit in the seat. Um, you know, we were watching, uh, I was chatting with Victor Vescovo, the, the funder and pilot uh, and owner of the submarine, 
Uh, we're both pilots and technical backgrounds, so we're talking about all sorts of things about the submarine. Uh, I'm asking him about things he's seen on his earlier dives to the Marianas Deep. He's done something like eight dives there now. Uh, we left the lights off outside the submarine because we wanted to save our battery power for time on the bottom. So we were not trying to watch things as we went down. Uh, we're also descending so quickly that anything that might be out there would streak by in the viewport and you wouldn't get a very good view of it. So you know, we just chatted and checked in with the surface ship and monitored our systems and decided when we would eat lunch so that we were not distracted by being hungry on the bottom. So we ate lunch at 32,000 feet below sea level. Uh, so this was a privately funded trip. Yes, the uh, surface ship that carries the submarine called Pressure Drop and the submarine are uh, were both uh, the vision of and the private funding of Victor Viscovo. And this, what this did year's he, campaign... What, how, did, how did he earn his money to be able to do this? Um, uh, mainly as an investment banker or, or an investor, is my understanding. Um, uh, you did a stint as a Navy uh, intelligence officer as well, but then ended up in uh, finance and investment uh, banking and has you know, done very well with that. Uh, and you know, he's quite an intrepid explorer as well, Victor is. He has climbed the, to the highest point of all the seven continents, so he's reached the seven summits. And he had skied across both the North Pole and the South Pole. That combination is called the Explorer's Grand Slam. So he'd already done that, and somewhere along the way in achieving all of those things, it struck him that it was odd that there wasn't some similar kind of access and engagement with the deepest points in the ocean. And there's a deepest spot in each of the five major oceans of the world. So that's what spurred him to fund this boat and fund the submarine and set off to reach the deepest point in all five oceans. He did that last year on the Five Deeps expedition. So do you think between him and Elon Musk uh, launching, uh, you know, trying to develop commercial trips to other planets, is the future in space or in deep, deep oceans becoming private as opposed to government funded? I don't think either of them will shift to being entirely private funded. Uh, in Victor's case, the submarine that he has built, really, it is incredibly transformative in terms of the ability to explore the deep ocean. The first people to reach the bottom of the Marianas Trench got there in 1960. The next dive with a person aboard was 52 years later. So between dive number one and dive number two was 52 years. While I was out at sea with Victor, we did three dives in the span of seven days. He's still out there on a second segment of the campaign. They've done three dives and probably will get four dives done in seven to 10 days. So that reliability and repeatability of being able to take people to any point, any of the deepest spots in any of the oceans sort of on demand is an extraordinary step forward. That is not the kind of thing that uh, I think a government funding agency would have uh, embarked on because no one could give them a really good answer for you know, why would we do that? What would the really tangible, quantifiable benefit be? of doing that. Uh, so it takes it takes vision, vision and it takes the independent capacity to do that. Uh, Elon's, Elon Musk's effort with SpaceX uh, has been a mixture of both public and private money. Uh, you know, NASA provided very substantial support, uh, something like $1.6 billion at the startup. Uh, and Mr. Musk has also raised a, a lot of private capital. But the idea there too is make it more frequent, make it reliable, make it less expensive to move cargo and people off the planet. The trick question to my mind, and especially in the space arena is, when I say commercial, I mean there's actually a demand function there. There's actually multiple companies or parties or individuals that want to go. So the costs start to be spread over private citizens and companies of different sizes. And you know, if the government needs to send astronauts there, they can buy a seat on the spaceship like we buy seats for government employees on airlines instead of running the airline. But that whole idea depends on whether there really is enough demand from other people and other parties, other players, to go in and out of space. I think it's going to be a long time coming, if ever, before you see a market that's akin to commercial air travel. Do you think uh, that mankind will and womankind um, will be able to find 
to resolve climate change before it destroys the planet? Because many scientists think we're past that point. Uh, if we're not past it, we're very close to it and, and continuing to move in the wrong direction, certainly. Uh, I like to remind people that the, the issue is not the planet. The planet will be fine. The planet will adapt and adjust. The question is, what will, what will the habitability, what will the livability of the planet be? And what will the viability uh, of human societies and, and humankind be? Well, and animals, uh, so the, animals too, whom we're, ki we're well, killing all, uh, species off like crazy. The, the planet will be fine. It might go down the path of becoming a Venus or a Mars. The question is, what can live on this planet and how? Uh, and yes, I mean, I, I definitely don't mean to uh, elevate human interests above all other living interests on the planet. But the, I think the shocks that, and signals that might first rouse society, human society, to more uh, to bolder action are going to be big dislocations uh, in the economies and the food supply and the water supply that will hope perhaps wake people up. It might be too late. There's no, there's no going back to the 19th century or 18th century. The arrow of time only goes forward, uh, Stephen Jay Gould said. So we've got to be working on solutions that give us a path forward uh, to sustaining the viability of the planet overall, including the viability of humankind. Uh, do you think the viability of humankind becomes uh, less and less viable, so to speak? Uh, as more and more people are added to the planet, we're over seven billion now, heading for nine billion by mid-century. Well, I, I think the Earth, like any system of systems, has a some finite carrying capacity, uh, and that will have multiple dimensions to it: of you know, water and food, and uh, the uh, resiliency of natural ecosystems. And yeah, population, human population pressure is the largest consistently growing uh, source of pressure on all of those factors. Uh, we only have a couple of minutes left here, and I want to talk to you about gender in science. You obviously are an extremely accomplished scientist and a woman. Um, have you experienced gender discrimination in, in your career? Uh, yeah, I honestly have to say I've never been exposed to any of the, the worst and most uh, malicious forms uh, that I know other women have encountered. I've certainly had plenty of occasions. I'm, I'm old enough that when I started going out into field camps as a geologist or out on research ships as an oceanographer, you know, that was odd. Uh, it made some men discomfort, uncomfortable. There were always questions of, somehow the questions always turned down to, we don't know where you're going to go to the bathroom. So, that's my problem. I'll fix that. You know, not to worry. Um, so wait a sec. So what did? How did you? How did you fix that? Did you just go to the bathroom when they weren't in the bathrooms, or how did that? Where did you take showers? I, yeah. Well, it, it probably helps to be a little bit uh, flexible on your own sense of privacy. But uh, yeah, it was it was some usually amusing things like I, I need I slept overnight in a sleeping bag somewhere at a camp and I'm going to get up and put on my clothes and that means I'm going to get up and not be fully clothed for a moment and I'm not going to go wriggle around in my sleeping bag trying to get dressed just because you don't think you ought to you know you're just going to stand up in your skivvies and get dressed and I'm supposed to be just perfectly okay with that so let's just put that all aside do what you need to do I'm going to do what I need to do um, we can share bathrooms uh, timeshare bathrooms it's just there, there have been some fun stories in my early NASA days when we would land at a military base to refuel, you'd walk in the front door and there'd always be uh, the weather office and the flight planning office and admin and, and the snack shop and right there, the men's room. And I'd ask where the ladies room was. And very often it was on the far side of this gigantic hangar, you know, off in a hidden corner somewhere. And sometimes I would trek over and use the ladies room, but every now and then I would grab whoever I was flying with and stick them out front, outside the door of the men's room and say, you're a Marine, stand guard, and just go in and use that bathroom. <laughs> it's a toilet. It's going to flush. It's going to be all right. <laughs> and the guys were okay with guarding it for you for a, a little while. They, they, they were. I mean, uh, all the guys I flew with, both in T-38 jets and the shuttle, it was just, guys, we're here to do something. I mean, whatever soap opera drama ideas you have in the back of your mind, they're not happening on this crew. They're not happening on this flight. Let's just help each other out. 
uh, you know, changing clothes on the space shuttle for, with my crews boiled down to someone saying, I'm changing my shirt now, or I'm changing my shorts now. And everyone would just mentally create a little bubble of privacy and ignore that fact. And off you go. Dr. Sullivan, thank you so much for your time and for your enlightening stories and for your firsts in space and in the ocean and uh, for paving the way for more women to make it uh, more possible for women and women of color. You're also active on Twitter with uh, Black Lives Matter um, to make it to open doors for other women to in the future become what you have become and, and do great things with their lives. Thank you so much. Uh, that's it for this edition. Please join us online at www.tothecontrary.org or watch us on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. And I'm Bonnie Urbe. And whether you think to the contrary, please join us next week. Funding for To the Contrary provided by the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, the Colcom Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. For a transcript or to see an online version of this episode of To the Contrary, please visit our PBS website at pbs.org forward slash to the contrary. PBS.